Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful, and we do want to bless your holy name. We come into your presence with awe and love that you would know our name and you would care about us so much that you would send your only begotten son to come and rescue us and live within us so that we can live victoriously. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for putting your life in us. Thank you for welcoming us to, into your presence and we come with our soul filled with thanksgiving that our eyes were open, and that we're part of your great, big, wonderful family. We thank you for this evening. We thank you for this, your day. As we come to the close of it, we're so blessed to be able to be in your presence once again as a family. Make the places holy where people are worshiping you tonight. And we pray that the Holy Spirit will go out and touch them and give them the miracles that they need, the healing that they need, the joy that they need. Thank you, Lord. We pray for Milton and others, Lord, who are sick. And we pray, Lord, that you will encourage those that are undergoing treatments, those who are unable to come this morning because they were not feeling well. We just rebuke this last wave of that COVID virus in Jesus' name, we say enough already. And we pray the peace of God that passes all understanding to cover us. And we pray for those who are traveling this week to come for the Bible school and for the conference. We ask your divine blessings and covering over them too, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, we're look looking forward to a couple of great weeks. This week is our Bible School Week. Actually, it's the first course of our cycle of two years for an associate's degree, if you would like to work for a degree, or if you would like to just come and enjoy the anointing te anointed teachers, you are welcome to come too. So be sure you sign up, and the week after that, we're going to have a men's and a women's conference together. And because uh, we are missing a team from the mainland, our favorite people, and Pastor John DeMello, I believe, are going to fill in, and Pastor Rob and his wife Nora will also be here again to be a part of that. So we're expecting a great time. Don't come by yourself. Bring somebody with you. And we pray that we all will have a refreshing in our soul, but that Maui will be changed because we've come together in Jesus' name. These people coming with a lot of sacrifices, so let's be in prayer for that. And so I pray that we will just enjoy the service and worship the Lord. We're glad again on Sunday nights to have Pastor Rob to teach us about the names of God. So we're going to sing a couple of praise songs and turn the service over to him because we're always so blessed by Amen. the presence of Pastor Rob and his wife, Nora, when she can be with us. So let's enjoy the praises of God together as our faithful brother James. <laughs> he was really scared because Rob was a little bit late. Rob just got in. I said, James, you got to preach tonight. Well, amen. <laughs> you know, pastors always have last minute calls and so forth, but thank you. And James, thank you for your faithfulness. I appreciate that. Okay, let's sing together. Amen.
Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return And come and singing unto Zion And everlasting joy shall be upon their head Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return And come and singing unto Zion And everlasting joy shall be upon their head they shall obtain gladness and joy And sorrow and mourning shall flee away Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return And come and singing unto Zion And everlasting joy shall be upon their head Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return And come and singing unto Zion And everlasting joy shall be upon their head Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return And come and singing unto Zion And everlasting joy shall be upon their head they shall obtain gladness and joy And sorrow and mourning shall flee away Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return And come singing unto Zion And everlasting joy shall be upon their head Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only do it wondrous things, who only do it wondrous things, and blessed be his glorious name for ever. And the whole earth be filled with His glory. Amen. 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 Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel. Who only do it wondrous things, who only do it wondrous things, and blessed be his glorious name forever. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel. Who only do it wondrous things, who only do it wondrous things, and blessed be his glorious name forever. And the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen. 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 Blessed be. Lord God, the God of Israel. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only do it wondrous things, who only do it wondrous things, and blessed be his glorious name forever. Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus. We praise your name tonight. And we have a special guest tonight again, every Sunday. He always blesses my heart when he shares with us. He's so knowledgeable, and it opened my eyes. There's a lot of things that he teaches that I haven't heard before, so God bless him for doing so. Thank you very much. Rob Finberg. Thank you so much. It's good to hear that I say things that you've never heard before. I hope somebody's heard it before, or otherwise I might be making it all up. I don't want to be accused of that. 
but it's an honor and a delight. I want to talk about the names of God. Just by way of review, take a running start at this, is God has many names because no single name can encompass all that God is. And God reveals his power, his majesty, his might, his care, his love in so many different ways. And his people responded to him, and they called him by the name of their most recent experience. So if the Lord was a shepherd in our life, they called the Lord my shepherd. That was one of his names, uh, Jehovah Ra'a. And then when he's a healer, the Lord is my healer. Well, I want to talk about the name of God as a banner. And what is a banner? You know, God is a, well, uh, it's an important thing. It's known to people in, in a military background. It's a place of a rallying point. We see some very inspiring images sometimes of a battlefield. The most famous, perhaps, battle of World War II is the Battle of Iwo Jima. And you know that statue based on a photograph when the Marines finally took the high point of the island and it saw that victory was in their grasp. There were three or four soldiers that were planting that flag. You can see that image in your mind now as they're struggling to raise the banner. You know, of all the things in life uh, that needed to be attended to, the wounded, uh, the missing, the prisoners, the skirmishes that likely were still going on, there was a lot of things to do. But those men of Iwo Jima, the Marines, were so motivated, so passionate about planting the American flag, a proclamation to all of the troops that had sacrificed so much to take back the control of that part of the world, a tiny island, but the blood that was shed, the lives that were lost, and they plant the flag there saying, victory is ours. And a banner is an important aspect of that. That is what a banner is. It's a flag, sometimes called a signal. It is that which rallies the troops or, or takes whatever the effort, the culmination of the battle, and says the battle was won, and therefore we plant the flag. So that's it. That's our image. We're going to talk about God, our banner, Jehovah Nisi. We're going to talk about that tonight. By way of review, we covered God's name as Elohim. Elohim is a plural word, and it's important to understand God, the Father, does not exist alone. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit always existed together. And what is that? Why is that significant to us? Well, one of the Godhead came to earth in the flesh as a helpless baby, grew up, lived a, a life not much different from our, own, uh, from our own. He worked. He had parents. He was a member of a community. He lived his life not known for who he was, although obviously his mother Mary knew. But he, he lived his life with all the temptations, with all the difficulties, all the challenges that we human beings have. And so we have a great high priest, the scripture says, who is fully aware intercessor and he can't properly intercede unless he understands where we're coming from he knows our pain our weaknesses our difficulty we say he's the kind of guy a relationship holy spirit is a person and the holy spirit had fellowship with the father and the son and the son had fellowship with the father and the spirit and the father had fellowship with the spirit and the son. Through love god enjoyed love then his whole creation is nothing new in the realm of love. It's a duplication of relationship. So he loves you. Why? Because he made love that is really genuinely intimate. And so what Jesus is saying is where two or three are gathered, he is really saying where you can have intimate relationship, that's where I am. Why? Because he's a God that loves intimate relationships. That's why he asks us to come away with him, to be in that secret place of the Most High, to commune with him, come into a prayer closet, to come away from the crowds and spend time with him. 
Why? Because we can't have it in the crowd. We need that. So I hope that you look at this verse where two or three are gathered, there am I in the midst, to understand that Jesus cherishes relationships and he wants us to cherish relationships. He wants us to have an intimate relationship with two or three people. Really genuine. Someone we can open up to. Someone we can be accountable to. Someone we could say, no matter what I'm going through, I could be honest, I could be real. Now, we pastors go to conferences, and when we go to conferences, we get to hear some of the best of the best. And I can remember going to numerous conferences where a guy would come out and he would talk about starting a church on a Wednesday afternoon, and by Sunday morning, they had 4,000 people there, and they took up an offering, bought 200 acres of land, built a cathedral, and everything has gone smoothly. I've been to a couple of those conferences, and I get nothing out of them, because I'm not that kind of a guy. But I've been to other conferences where people will talk, and they'll say, I had such struggles in my life. I cried myself to sleep. I said, Lord, where are you? What am I doing? And I'm thinking, that sounds like me. <laughs> Sounds like what I've been through. And they have me in rapt attention. I just want to hear how they went from the despair and the brokenness in their life to the place of victory. They have to go through the valley to come up onto the mountain. And that's where intimacy, relationship is so valuable. When somebody really knows us, they feel our pain, our difficulties, they can minister to us. But if we're just a a person, just an acquaintance, well, they could just hold up a sign, you know, be happy, don't worry. No, we need somebody to touch our heart, and we need to touch someone's heart. We need intimacy in our life. So where two or three are gathered, there am I in the midst, is an exhortation to make place in our Christian life for having a close, close relationship with two or three people. Now, that's especially important for those of us that go through trials and difficulties. We need somebody. I think there are so many lonely people in ministry, and when they have a struggle, they can't go to their congregation. They can't take time on Sunday morning and say, oh, brothers and sisters, I'm going through such a hard time. And They need somebody. They can pick up the phone, they can call, and they can say, can we get... Together, can you pray with me? Can you, can you listen? It's just so vitally important, and it's essential Christianity. Where did that come from? Surprisingly, it came from the ancient eternity past, that God always had an intimate relationship. That's what he had in mind when he said the word love. Elohim, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, three being one. Then we talked about God, our healer. I hope I emphasized enough the fact that whatever we face in life that is out of health, that God is our healer for that. It's not just physical. I've seen amazing miracles in the physical, as I'm sure you have. And there are testimonies we hear all the time. But there are so many emotional wounds that have to be healed. So many troubled Uh, mental issues. I don't know uh, if we could even begin to understand the complexity of mental issues. I I know that there are uh, people that have gone through uh, mental breakdown, in a sense, or anxiety is overwhelmed. They've been paralyzed in life. And uh, to come out of that requires healing, PTSD, other issues. And I want you to know that the Lord, when he says, I am the Lord that healeth thee, encompasses that as well. That there are people that can come out of great trauma in their life, sexual abuse, and they could be healed and restored. I am the Lord that healeth thee. So tonight I want to emphasize, I am the Lord thy banner. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord our banner. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Exodus 17. We want to turn over to that and find that as a place and an important reference. Exodus 16. No, I'm sorry. Exodus 17. We 
It's an important chapter, and I want to give a running start at this. The Israelites had come out of Egypt, and it's amazing because there was great victory. You remember they crossed over the Red Sea, and Moses had led the people through on dry land, and then the Egyptians were coming. A great scene. You know, I can see them kicking up the dust, the Egyptians, as they're approaching the Israelites, and the Israelites are moving masses of humanity, 600,000 men plus women and children. So assuming a family had three, four children, you're talking about well over a million people, a million people moving. It's a mass of humanity across the Red Sea. And so they could see the Egyptians kicking up dust as they came on the chariots, and they're coming, come on, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. And they're going through and going through, and they finally get to the other side, and they've come up out of the basin of the Red Sea, the walls of water standing up on both sides, and then Moses gives the signal, lifts up his staff, and the waters come back upon one another. At that point, the Egyptian army had come down from the mountain, crossed the basin of the Red Sea, and were swallowed up. They were drowned in the Red Sea. And then Miriam gets all excited, the sister of Jesus of uh, Moses, and starts proclaiming a spontaneous song. She's singing in the spirit to the Lord, and she's celebrating and dancing. Great high point. That Sunday morning, do you know what happened on Wednesday night at the midweek service? They're grumbling and complaining. There's no fresh water. They're out in the wilderness, and they want to go back to Egypt. They want to call quits on this whole deliverance. That's why we need a midweek service. Because people can have a glorious experience in God on Sunday morning and they'll backslide by Wednesday night. It happened to the Israelites. It is not those high points because human beings take that on an emotional high for as long as it can sustain them. But after a night's sleep or missing a meal, they can drop right back to wherever they started. God knowing that in human nature, he said, when you're out in the wilderness, I'm going to take care of you. And he understood. They started to complain. They were backbiting against Moses. They're disputing. So let's read it so we get the perspective. And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin... Uh, and that is not referring to the sin that we know, uh, uh, the uh, transgression or the iniquity. It just happens to be the name of the place in the wilderness. After their journeys, according to the commandment of the Lord, and pitched at Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore, the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide you with me? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. This is more serious than just your usual backsliding. They want to kill the pastor. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, and take with thee the elders of Israel, and thy rod wherewith thou smotest the river, and take in thy hand, and go, and behold, I will stand before thee there upon a rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders. And he called the name of the place Massa. And Mirabah, which means uh, striving and complaining. And he called the place Masa and Mirabah because of the chiding of the children of Israel, because they tempted or tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Then came Amalek. Now, let me just, before I get to Amalek, and this is the key that we need to focus on later in the chapter, but this is important. You know, Moses dealt with a rock providing water twice. Do you remember that in the Bible? The first time he was told to take his staff and strike the rock, and water came out. What was he asked to do when they needed water again later in the wilderness? They came upon another rock. What was he asked to do? 
Speak to the rock. He was not to strike it. But you remember, the people were, again, complaining and difficult. And you don't know how miserable it could be to be in leadership of Jewish people. I know because I'm Jewish. They can make your life miserable. And so what are you going to do? We're out here. We're going to starve. We're going to drink. You know, what about our children? You know, they make it sound so righteous. And they're putting pressure on Moses. And Moses is just at a point of unbearable frustration. And so instead of speaking to the rock as he's told to do the second time, what does he do? He struck the rock. Now Moses had lived a very colorful life of leadership. He'd come out of Pharaoh's household as a son of the royalty. He had been uh, disenfranchised from the Egyptian people when he killed the Egyptian, buried him in the sand. Then he was disenfranchised from his own people because they, he thought that was a secret, but the next time he saw two Hebrews arguing, he tried to play peacemaker, and they said, what are you going to do, kill us like he killed the Egyptian? He realized, <clears throat> these people aren't going to protect me. They're going to turn me into the authorities. So he fled, and he was isolated from everyone, and that's when God called him. And God raised him up as a great leader, gave him Aaron to be a spokesperson, and did these mighty miracles from him. But he had been a murderer, had two wives, had alienated himself from his royal family and from the Israelites on a number of occasions. As you can see here, they're ready to stone him. He had done a lot to sacrifice for the Lord. That's what I'm saying. And he wasn't a perfectly righteous man in that he had not done anything wrong. He had murdered a man, after all. But what happened when he struck the rock the second time? <clears throat> By striking the rock the second time, God pronounced a judgment on him that was extremely severe. You remember what it was? He said, Moses... I know you've been out in the wilderness for 40 years. I know you're within sight of the promised land. I know what you've given up. You gave up the comfort of Pharaoh's court. You've been out here with these complainers who threatened to stone you. I know all that you've been through. But I tell you, you refuse to sanctify me before the people. And because you refuse to do that, you will never, never enter the promised land. I will not let you go in. Your life's work, <clears throat> the legacy, whatever you've given your life to do, I'm now cutting you off from it. You will die in the wilderness. I remember the first time I came across that, I thought, how unfair, how severe that is. It isn't like he struck his mother-in-law. He struck a rock. He didn't hurt anybody. He just was frustrated. Anybody could understand that. You're around a lot of people that are saying faster, faster, harder, harder, more and more. Do something. Do something for all of us. We count on you. You're not doing it. We're unhappy. And finally, he just, he, in frustration, he strikes a rock, an inanimate rock. Well, you know, the water still came out. God said, speak to it, the second rock, and water will come out. And he struck it. He didn't do the, didn't follow the instructions, but the water came out anyway. It tells me two profound things about God. First of all, God will carry out in his compassion the best for the people. If Pastor Finberg doesn't do a perfect job, he will still reach the people. I cannot tell you how many times I have ministered the word of God, carefully prepared, giving precise teaching as I understand it, and somebody will come to me and thank me for the message for something I never said. It happens all the time. I could be talking about tithing, and they say to me, Pastor, thank you. I've decided to forgive my brother-in-law. I said, I didn't refer to forgiveness, and I didn't refer to your brother-in-law. I stopped asking where you got that from. I just put that up in the Lord's hands. He let water flow out of this rock, even though this rock wasn't that in tune with what God wanted me to deliver. He bypassed me. And that's what he did with Moses. He bypassed me, let the water come out, feed the people. 
But Moses disobeyed, and he paid a very, very dear price. And that's the second lesson. The first rock was to be struck. So what's so bad about striking the rock a second time? In Corinthians, it says, that rock was Christ. You see, Christ coming the first time in order to bring living water to mankind had to be struck, smitten of God and afflicted. That's what brought life, Calvary, the beatings, the purging, the crucifixion, and ultimately his death. That's when the living water started to flow. You remember when they opened up his side, out came blood and water. And as that flowed out, it brought salvation to mankind. But how about today, 2022 in January? How is a person saved? All that call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's why we speak to the rock for living water. But Jesus Christ was never intended by the Father to be crucified a second time. By Moses striking the rock the second time, he was demonstrating to the people that Christ would be smitten a second time. And God could not let that stand. He could not let the people believe that Christ would be crucified again and again and again. In Hebrews it says, crucified once and for all, for all people of all generations. So God had a choice. Should I do nothing to Moses and hope the people don't get the wrong idea? Or can I cut this, nip it in the bud so that people understand salvation doesn't come by a second smiting of the rock of my salvation. And so there we have it. This is what has preceded. This is what's led up to it. Now, let's get for a moment to, uh, by the way, I need to say this, that when a type, such as this rock being Christ, that's called a type, it means a symbol of something. When there's an inanimate object that represents Christ, it's called a type. So you have types in the tabernacle or the Passover lamb, or in this case, the rock in Horeb. When you have a type, God is extremely protective of types, more so, believe it or not, than commandments. So Moses had broken the commandment, thou shalt not kill, and he, of course, killed the Egyptian, buried him in the sand. But he wasn't severely judged for that as much as striking an inanimate rock. But it wasn't the rock, it was the type. And God said, my types are precious to me. And that's why you have men like Uzzah in the Bible, who reached out his hand to steady the ark, smitten dead. Severe judgment on a type. He reached out to the ark, which represented the presence of God, that the flesh would come in contact with the presence of God, unacceptable, a violation of the type. Uzzah had to die. Moses striking the rock, cannot get into the promise. He cannot continue his mission and a legacy on such a basis. Is that true today? Well, it was in the early church, and perhaps it is today. Some people who take communion unworthily For that reason, some are sick and even sleep, die. So yes, God's types are exceedingly precious to him. Now to Amalek. We are in the eighth verse of the 17th chapter. And then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose out men, go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and Hur went up on the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. They took a stone, they put it under him. And he sat there on, and Aaron and Hur stayed upon his hands. One on one side, one on the other. And his hands were steady until the going down in the sun. And Joshua discomforted Amalek 
and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi, the Lord my banner. For he said, Because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Now here's, we need some clarification. Amalek was a nation of people who attacked Israel from behind. When they were coming through, they perhaps had some stragglers, maybe some elderly, some children. For whatever reason, they were back. They weren't the soldiers up at the front. The soldiers were going into foreign territory and expected to protect the group being up front. But what Amalek did was cowardly and unacceptable in the compassionate eyes of God. They were coming to pick off the weakest members of the Israelites. God hated it. God to this day hates the abuse against the childish, the fatherless, the poor, the out of the way. You know, there's severe commandments for people that don't take care of the blind and the sick and the out of the way. Where did that come from in the law of Moses? It comes from God calling people to be compassionate for the weakest members of society. A mullock represented the opposite of that. His whole mission of a mullock was to destroy the weakest members. And for this, God said, I want to blot out the memory of a mullock. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean killing every man, woman, and child of a mullock? No. It means to de- destroy the strategy and the association that this tribe had for preying on the weak and defenseless. So this is something that God wants to be memorialized. He wants his people, you and me, the Israelite nation in this generation, to be people that care for the weakest members of our society. You know, there's not many wise, not many noble, not many mighty that are called in the church. But if we spend our time just looking for the high and mighty, that they might be a part of the church, we might share the message of the good news with them, and we ignore the weak and the out of the way, and maybe the unlovely, We're not doing what God wants us to do. He wants us to reach out to every person, to not look at a person and say, well, they'll never be a tither. They'll never be a a good Sunday school teacher. They'll never be. No. These are the very people that God wants us to minister life to, bring them into the kingdom. And that's why he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. These are the people that are overlooked by society because the world has standards of leadership and control and power. But the kingdom has its values in servanthood, love, compassion, rescuing. So Amalek needed to be wiped out as a principle. God does not want the strategy of Amalek to succeed in this world where people learn to prey on the weakest members. Now we have that today. We have people that go after the elderly, go after the poor, and they, they, they do whatever they can. There's an increase in crime in America right now. And who are they preying on? The fit, the tough, the capable? No. The elderly, the weak, the women in our society. This is abominable. This is exactly why God said, wipe out the memory of a mullock. This is a spirit that's loosed in the world. Now, what God says at the end of this chapter, and I'll be wrapping this up in a few minutes, but I'm saying that God had a great victory over a mullock. God's people do it. And how did he get the victory? He got it by Moses raising his hands. Now, what's that all about? He's not talking about swordsmanship. He's talking about intercession. 
He's not even talking about the strategy of the military minds. He's talking about, you get me involved where there's warfare and I'll give you victory. Time would not allow us to cover all of those times when God's people entered into battle that God gave supernatural victory. Hezekiah, Sennacherib's outside of Jerusalem, ready to cut off the water supply, surround the city, lay siege to it. He's got his battering rams ready to assault the city. They're ready to have the archers come and fly arrows over the wall. And Isaiah comes to Hezekiah and says, don't let this bother you. I'm going to turn these armies around, I'm going to send them back, and I'm going to wipe out the leadership. Sennacherib himself, not a single arrow will fly in the city. 2 Kings 18. And you know, that's exactly what happened. Sennacherib got word that he needed to go back into town. He goes back to his headquarters in Assyria, and while he's in the temple of his god, two of his sons assassinate him. They flee. His other son becomes king in his place, and they never bothered Hezekiah. When Hezekiah took that letter that Sennacherib had read, and he said, this is what Sennacherib wants to do. He went into the house of God and he says, this isn't against me, God. This is against you. What are you going to do about this? God took care of it. When they woke up after Hezekiah had showed the letter to God, Of course, God saw the letter before, but when he took it in, God saw his faith, and he said, you know what, I'll take care of this. Because you're right, the battle is not yours, or yours, or yours, or mine. The battle is the Lord's. And God is looking for you and me to recognize that this is a battle of his. He doesn't want to know about our cleverness and our devices. He wants to take this. The Bible is about that. God's name, Jehovah Nissi, is a reminder that the battles that you face in your life are really God's battles. You carry his name. He wants you to show to the world that you've got a great God. The world doesn't need a great man of God or a great woman of God. You know what he needs? Any person that has a great God. That's what makes the difference to the world. People come in to me and say, why are you blessed? And I'm blessed because I got a great God. I could see in your life you're blessed. I could see that you've overcome. I heard what you were going through last year, and somehow you came out of it. How did that happen? I got a great God. I heard you were in the hospital on your last day. You were about to perish. How did it get it turned around? I got a great God. I heard you had a rebellious son that was giving you heartache all of his life and he's been incarcerated and he's been in difficulty all his life. Where is he now? Oh, today he's in the ministry. He's serving God. He's bringing people to Jesus. How'd that happen? We got a great God. We got a great God. That's the difference. That's why he's Jehovah Nissi. He wants, he wants you to see him as that banner. You know, he already planted the banner of victory in your life. You say, oh, no, I don't, I don't have all those victories. But he did. He planted it on a hill called Mount Calvary. He planted the banner there. It's a bloodstained banner. But that bloodstained banner bought your victory in your healing, in your deliverance, in the battles you have. And in case you haven't noticed it, life is a battle. The forces of hell are out after our children, out after our country, out after our relationships, trying to destroy marriages, trying to destroy hope, destroy churches. The minute you and I think that the battle is ours and that we can fix it, we have dismissed and bypassed that banner that sits in Calvary. What a tragedy that would be. Is that the message of the Bible? Absolutely. For we wrestle not against flesh 
and blood, but against principality and against power and against spiritual wickedness in high places. And the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. That's the kind of battles we want to see. Now we're emerging from a very costly pandemic. I was at a doctor's conference yesterday. Some of the most distinguished researchers and physicians in America gathered here on Maui. It was a tightly held conference, mostly for doctors. I, I kind of put my mask on. I looked like an operating surgeon. They let me in. <laughs> Plus, I had to pay the fee. But I was glad I was there. These doctors pay a great, great price to keep us healthy, to give us good information, how we might keep ourselves healthy and our loved ones healthy. They were great doctors facing a great battle. But there was a spirit of optimism underneath all of the bad reports. And one of the doctors, a Jewish doctor, not a believer in Jesus Christ, but he came to me and he said, you know, Pastor, you hold the key. I'm not used to secular people saying that to me. But he said, You said, I said, in What way? He said, Pastor, there is no way out of the battle that's going on in America except God. Isn't that amazing? A secular physician says to me and to Pastor Milhone, who was at the conference as well, he said, you are the key because I cannot imagine how this tangled mess could come undone except for God. Amen. It's very true. It's very, very true. But here's the perspective. Do you know our country went through a great civil war? Every casualty of the civil war was an American whether it was north or south. It was the most costly war that we were ever involved in. More Americans died in the Civil War than in World War II or World War I. It was a great tragedy. President Abraham Lincoln recognized he couldn't count on his incompetent generals who were supposed to wrap up the war in a couple of weeks, dragged on for over four years. Terrible loss of life. Whole cities burned to the ground. Economies upside down. He just said, how can we expect to pull out of this without God's help? And he called for a national day of prayer. But tragedies and conflicts in America did not end. In 1918, America entered the First World War. A war where literally... The Bible fulfilled prophecy. Nation rose up against nation, kingdom against kingdom. It's a Jewish idiom that means that all the world goes to war. And in World War I, that was very true. Every one of the 180 nations, 185 nations, went to war against one another in some capacity, either by alliance or by supply or by actually sending troops. Every nation on the planet except four entered into that great worldwide cataclysm known as World War I. Back then, they didn't call it World War I. They called it the Great War because it was the war to end all wars. But in just a couple of decades, they had war again. And as the Nazis completely swept over Europe, people thought this is the end of freedom in the world. Nazism and fascism will take over. Another great challenge. In World War I, there were more deaths from the Spanish flu than were casualties of the war. More people died. You know what I called it, the Spanish flu? Because only Spain was accurately recording the number of deaths from the flu. They didn't have, it didn't originate in Spain. It actually originated, they think, in Kansas. And this virus was released, and people just died by the thousands and thousands. This was a time of great tragedy. America went through the Great Depression, another time of great tragedy. There have been numerous crises 
When the world unlocked the key of atomic power, it seemed to be a great crisis, the Cuban Missile Crisis. We were on the brink of all-out war with the Soviet Union. We have been in crises. When are we going to turn to God to get out of this crisis? When are we going to see that difference? God is standing by saying, my name is Jehovah Nissi. I'm your banner. I can see you through to victory. Are you going to trust this battle to me? Will you turn to me with your whole heart? And will you give this battle to me? That's what it takes. That's exactly what it takes. I want you to think of whatever battle is in your life, big or small, your child, your finances, your health, you think, and just say, Lord, this is your battle. Do whatever he wants you to do, but, but trust that this is a battle that the Lord wants you to win. You know what the main job of the church is in its relationship to Israel? It's to provoke them to jealousy. Get so blessed that Jewish people come knocking on your door and saying, hey, hey, what's going on at your house? I thought Jewish people were blessed. You seem to be so extraordinarily blessed. Tell me the secret. Oh, I'd love to. You see, the Jews gave birth to a Messiah that I trusted in, and since then he so blessed me, and he's given me the commission to receive these blessings so that they're so overflowing and obvious that you Jewish people would come to me and say, what on earth is going on? Now, how could God make them jealous unless you had victories in your life? If you were meant to be defeated by every victory, nobody would be knocking on your door. God intends victory. He is Jehovah Nissi. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I sometimes forget how ready you are and available you are to be our banner. That you're ready to plant another sign of victory, a signal on some mountaintop when I've been down in the valley. I trust in myself, trust in my friends, trust in the world, trust in so many wrong things that stop short of trusting in you. I just pray with my brothers and sisters from now on we would look to the hills from whence cometh our help, for our help cometh from the Lord. Lord, that you would see every one of these precious people, everyone that's in the virtual service today, that they'd have victory in their homes, victories in their families, victory in their health, victory in their finance. In the name of Jesus, we believe you to do that. That's your desire. Now, Lord, we give you that problem that's come to mind right now, the one that's in our mind. We just say, Lord, this is your battle. Take my son, Lord. Lead him into those green pastures and beside the still waters. Take my marriage, Lord, back to its vibrancy and passion. and Take my finances to a place of abundance that I could be a greater giver, that I could care for missions, the poor, the out of the way. And take those witnesses where the seeds have been planted and not cultivated, and Lord, give me victory that I might be a great witness for you in this generation. This is your battle, Lord. I thank you and I praise you for it. In Jesus' name. Let's get in the practice of doing that. Turning over all those battles to the Lord. Does that sound like a good idea? He will fight our battles for us. His name is Jehovah Nissi. Hallelujah. Well, I want to thank you for listening attentively. Exodus 17 was our verse, our portion of scripture, but it is battle after battle described in the Bible. In Ephesians 6, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Let's get the Lord involved in this pandemic. It's his battle. Let's see if he can get involved in our economy. Let's see if he can get involved in Washington, D.C., because our letters and our phone calls are not getting the job done. Let's see if we could just put that, say, Lord, look at this that's going on. Here's the letter. Here it is. What are you going to do about it? (laughs) And they'll do it. Well, thank you for listening. Thank you for joining. 
And most of all, thank you for being a faithful servant of the Lord. Give it to him and be a witness for him in this generation. All your friends, all your neighbors, all your family are counting on you to be victorious, and God will make sure that happens. The Lord bless you. We want to say aloha and good night. We want to give you a reminder about the conference that's coming up, and it will be a great conference. First time that they're getting men and women together. It's usually at a men's conference. They talk about how to be a better husband to the wives. I don't know what they say at women's conferences, but I'm going to find out. The dates of the conference... The 12th and 13th of February. It sounds like Lincoln's birthday. Good time to have a conference. All right. The Lord bless you. Good night. Mm-hmm.